Okay, let's get started. Welcome to workshop 180, where we are going to investigate block-in filtering internet DNS content. We have a great panel here. I'm going to give each of our panelists a few minutes to introduce the topic from uh, their point of view. And um, the intent here is that we spend the majority of our time on questions, either from remote participants or from you here in this room. Um, so uh, please be thinking about uh, how you would like to address this topic. Uh, um, let me begin by saying the ICANN Security and Stability Committee uh, produced a report, number 56, uh, about one month ago on the general topic uh, of this workshop, where the goal of that position paper, not a position paper, the, the goal of that paper was to outline what will be the impacts of blocking, so that if uh, DNS blocking is done uh, by a government under policy, uh, it has to be done somewhere, and there are choices about wh exactly where that blocking is done and how it's done, and each of those choices will have an impact, uh, various collateral effects uh, that may or may not be intended and may or may not be acceptable. Um, I commend you to this paper. It, uh, it, it does a fairly good job of um, outlining the problem space. Now. Um, as we go through this, we want to mostly talk about the policy impact rather than the various technical methods or uh, arguments about which technical method would be superior um, since we are here in a policy conference. Uh, but in cases where the technology really does matter and the uh, details really does matter, I'm going to ask e any of our panelists uh, or any of our questioners who want to bring up a, an, a, a technical point that they feel is quite germane to the policy questions, uh, to please be brief. Uh, this is not a technical audience or a technical conference. Um, so let me begin by introducing our panelists. Uh, we have here in the room with us Karen, uh, Karen Riley from EFF and the TOR Project. We have Robert Guerra, who is uh, Citizen Lab is what it says. Okay, all right. I call it Citizen Lab at the Monk School. We have Dmitry Burkov, who is here from Fatid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John Carr from BT Internet. Uh, European Children's. European Federation. Children's. Okay, yeah. used to be. Okay, and Xiaolong Li, who is the uh, Vice President for Asia in uh, ICANN. Um, and was formerly the CTO for CN Nick, who is the top-level country code administrator for the .CN. Um, so let me ask each panelist to spend uh, just a few minutes outlining what uh, they think is important about this topic, and I will go last. So, Karen. Okay, I should clarify, I'm just here with the TOR project, uh, not the EFF there. Well capable of representing themselves. Um, so the TOR project is an anonymity and censorship circumvention system. It's freely available software. Um, in, in this context, uh, the existence of TOR demonstrates the futility of a lot of blocking and filtering measures. They are very easy for end users to bypass. Also, our work with vulnerable populations who need to protect their identities and bypass censorship demonstrates that uh, blocking in the name of vulnerable populations, it can actually be counterproductive. It makes us wary of policies that are supposedly put in place to protect them. Uh, thank you, Paul, for, for inviting me in, uh, to this panel, and, and thank you, everyone, for coming to the session. As you mentioned, uh, my name is Robert Gare. I'm with the Citizen Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. And one of the initiatives that the Citizen Lab is part of is the OpenNet Initiative. The OpenNet Initiative is a collaborative uh, research network together with Harvard, um, Cambridge, and a variety of other partners that have been documenting um, internet blocking or internet censorship since about 2003. 
and uh, we've published uh, a variety of books on how internet censorship and internet blocking has evolved uh, since 2003. Um, and um, we've done extensive technical uh, analysis and in-field research. And the big worry for us has been that um, blocking has gone from a, a handful of countries back then to well over 42 countries, if not more, particularly in developed democracies. And uh, we're starting to see a lot of um, issues in regards to upstream filtering um, and collateral damage, as I would call it, in regards to filtering and how it's changed from just filtering to more uh, nuanced uh, information controls. Um, and so interested to, to bring that perspective to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Dimitri? Uh, thank you, Paul. I'm, I'm Dmitry Burkov. I'm chairman of Foundation for Assistance for Internet Technology and Infrastructure Development from Russia. I want to uh, mark uh, and uh, some points because during the last 10 years, uh, the le legislation approach in the countries around the world significantly shifted. If 10 years ago, uh, we have uh, four types, we can classify as four types of government policies as to support internet industry self-regulations and, and user voluntary use of filtering blocking technologies. Second one was the criminal law penalties applicable to content providers who make content unsuitable for minors. Third was more restrictive, government required, mandated blocking of access to content defined as unacceptable for citizens. And last one, government restrictions of public access to internet. But now I uh, I want to raise the uh, issue that now we have practically around the world only two, the, the last two approaches. From another side, uh, second stream, ISPs significantly change their infrastructure and uh, can use some straightforward methods to execute <coughs> government orders. But what are the consequences for internet infrastructure in this case? Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. John? Uh, yeah, good morning. Uh, John Carr. I'm from the uh, United Kingdom, uh, where I work with a range of uh, children's organizations, child protection agencies. Um, in, the, in the Western democracies, um, filtering illegal content, and we were only talking about illegal content here by the way nothing else nothing political nothing religious uh, simply illegal content and in this case specifically child pornography or child abuse images as it should more properly be called uh, that began in the UK in uh, in 2004 when BT our biggest single internet service provider uh, started doing it and uh, the origins are very briefly of this were as follows um, in 1996, the internet industry established an organization called the Internet Watch Foundation. Its brief then was exclusively and specifically to deal with child abuse images that had been posted onto Usenet newsgroups. Um, often, these news, often these images would be posted within uh, newsgroups whose names left no ambiguity about the nature of the content that would be found within there. Uh, but sometimes the images were found more or less randomly distributed across different Usenet news groups. Now, the terms of reference under which the Internet industry initially established the uh, Internet Watch Foundation were very, very restrictive. What they said was the IWF staff can only react to complaints which they receive from members of the public about alleged illegal content found within Usenet news groups. They had no brief... Uh, to or no authority to go proactively looking for these images. They could only wait for them to be reported to them uh, by members of the public or whoever it was uh, who, who came across them in the news group. Um, and what we realized, um, maybe it took us two or three years, but nonetheless, eventually what we realized was that uh, the IWF could ha receive a report, look at the image, agree that it was likely to be found to be illegal under English law, uh, 
not British law, there's no such thing as British law, under English law, um, and they would then send a notice to the hosts uh, requesting that that specific um, thing be removed, but it could then reappear in exactly the same news group within minutes. Exactly the same image, exactly the same news group, and they would then have to wait for somebody else to report it to them a second time, or a third time, a fourth time, a 500th time, before they could act against it. Uh, more, and uh, in addition, these illegal images were appearing in the same news groups uh, uh, you know, time and time again, it was the same news groups every day, every week, every year that were being used in this illegal way. So in the end, the conclusion that we came to was that we should be more proactive. We should uh, cl list the entire news group uh, and close down the news group. Uh, and that's, in <coughs> fact, the decision that was taken uh, by the Internet Watch Foundation. It caused a huge row huge controversy at the time but nonetheless that was a decision taken in 2002 um, and once we'd crossed that hurdle and once uh, once it had been accepted that it was okay to block entire news groups and that the IWF staff could go out proactively looking for the images they didn't simply have to wait for to receive a report when images then started appearing at scale on websites we then had to consider how to respond to the emergence of these, this illegal content on the web. And to cut a long story short, in 2004, again after a great deal of uh, argument and controversy, the Internet Watch Foundation in the end decided to prepare a list of URLs where the individual images were found. We, we, never, uh, we never used DNS blocking, we never blocked entire domains, it was always based on the URLs. So the risk of collateral damage was very, very close to zero because you you simply couldn't, you know, it was the URL and nothing else that was being blocked. Um, and that's how the practice started. Now, police for, obviously this is all done very close, in very close collaboration with the police. Uh, URL filtering in the way we do it in the UK is a more expensive way of doing it. Police forces and organisations in other parts of the world thought it was too expensive or too complicated and they chose to do DNS filtering or IP blocking and that certainly does carry with it the risk of collateral uh, damage. Uh, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just noting that, that, that that's what happens uh, in other countries. Let me just be clear, we have never seen filtering and blocking of child abuse images as a, as a method of ensuring that those images are never seen by anybody anywhere. We all know about proxy servers, we all know about other methods by which people can get at them. But the key point is there are two key points. First of all, it disrupts the trade and therefore reduces it. Secondly, the people who are inclined or likely to use peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks or Tor clients or proxy servers are not the great mass of Internet users. They are a much smaller and more restricted group of people. And so to that extent, uh, DNS filtering, uh, filtering and blocking uh, works very well to reduce the scope for these images to be uh, made available. And it's about, by the way, protecting the dignity and the privacy of the children depicted in the images as much as it is anything else. Most children who are raped or sexually abused by adults don't have their pictures taken, don't have images taken of that abuse. Videos are not made of most instances of children being sexually abused and raped. It's only in a very small number of instances that child pornography uh, images are produced. It's wrong that the abuse took place in the first place. It's also wrong that those images were produced and circulated. We think it's important in the interest of the dignity of that child and the peace of mind of that child to do what we can to try and get those images out of public view as quickly as possible. And this is one method by which this can be done. Thank you, John. Shalong. Uh, good morning. I'm I'm Shadong Li, I'm the the Icon Vice President for for Asia. And as mentioned by by Paul Wixi, I'm the former CTO of Cynic. So uh, maybe I think everyone is uh, have a big interest on in China. So it's a little bit different type you know, the policy for 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 DNS blocking or filtering. So maybe that is why the Paul Wixi want me on the panel. Thank you for invite me to on the panel. So uh, from my point of view, you know I. Uh, in some sense, 
ICANN is not a body for, for, for discussion for, for dance blocking or filtering. So so maybe I can speak some word on on, on some personal cap capacity. Uh, you, you know, uh, I agree with with John. I, 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 uh, now it's uh, it's not necessary to discuss it is right or not to do the dance blocking or filtering. You, you know, uh, I think it's a uh, there's so many dance blocking and filtering is based on the reason of, for political or, or economy or, or cultural reason, reasons, and and they also there is the big debate debate on the new DTRDs uh, will be opened in the next year for for, uh, for ICANN. I think it's, uh, there should be a lot of uh, different kind of DTRDs open in, in the world. So, so also there is a big debate on how to make sure that the enabled DTRD to be universal acceptance. So I think it's, uh, there is a lot of discussion about the culture. For example, if you register a new GDRD, it's about some kind of cultural reasons, but maybe other countries don't, don't, don't like that. How to make sure this country, the people in this country can, can access the, the DRDs? I think it's different. To, it's, it's very, very difficult for you to make a decision if it is okay or, or not okay to, to block it. So I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, from my point of view, I think it's very, very difficult to, to make decision. And, and also, you know, I, I, I think it's, a, I, maybe I can give you a very simple example uh, from my p experience in China. You know, I, I, I think it's so many people know that some, some website cannot be accessed in China. Yeah. And also I, I, when I can announce the next ICA meeting, uh, in April next year, it will be held in Beijing. There are some people, so many people will ask me, Xiaodong, can you make sure that I can access all of the website in Beijing, in the hotel? Yeah, so, yeah, it's a good question. So I try to answer them. I kind of make progress because I, I'm not the Chinese president. So, you know, and also even I can make sure you can you can access the YouTube or Google or, or, or Twitter, but you know, there's a, uh, 200 millions of domain and and uh, maybe there's the over 20 million different kind of website how can i make sure you can access every website i, I don't know what's the real requirement for for over 2000 attendees for this this meeting so in, in some sense that i know you know there's some famous website and also there's unfamous website is is there are users maybe only thousand or, or ten thousand so it's a, it's a different kind of reasons for you to, to make decision if it is okay for you to access in China or not. So it, I, I, I do believe, you know, for example, in, in, from my experience in China, there is uh, some kind of reason to block the, the website. For example, the fishing site for, for anti workers and for some, for some cultural reasons, or also for some political reasons. So if... If the, you know that that is now the 280 uh, top domains, but uh, there is only 20, 21 GTRDs. Uh, others are 60 GTRDs. It's very easy for the country to make sure uh, they they can have the power to, to manage the 60 GTRD database uh, to to stop some website if the the government or the communities think it is appropriate. But uh, you know, for some GTRDs, they have no power. For example, if some some people Companies think that uh, one domain for .com or .net is uh, not okay for their uh, company's uh, brand or some uh, cultural reasons. Uh, you know, they have no power to ask Verizon if you can stop this website. I, I do believe Verizon if give, give, will give answer. I cannot stop that because maybe it is not appropriate for you, but it's okay for other persons. So I think now, you know, I have, have think about this issue for many years, but I cannot find a very, very easy answer to solve this. So I think it's a, I'm very happy that there's a lot of people join this, this panel. Maybe that some people can give some good ideas to, to show how to make decision to do some kind of principle or rules to do the DNS blocking or filtering in around the world. Yeah, and I, I know, you know, I can have that lo Slogan is one word, one internet. But you know, the one word means uh, a lot of countries with uh, different kind of cultures. And even one internet, it's one internet is not one network. They have 
I think it's over over sixty thousand different kind of ISPs. So so different ISP have a different kind of po- policy or different kind of rules. So how to make a principle to do that? I think it's a, also my my consideration. Thank you, Shannon. Um, we will be joined by David Hughes of the Recording Industry Artists Association. Um, and so I guess I, I misspoke earlier. I will not be last. He will be last. He's not here yet. Um, so the collateral damage that has been mentioned by several panels panelists here is very important in the, the spirit of the Internet itself. Um, when you take some kind of action, either as an Internet service provider or an uh, application vendor, equipment vendor, or as a government, perhaps with a national firewall, um, it's inevitable that you will uh, affect some things beyond your intent. Um, you will make certain things possible, new kinds of crime that perhaps was not your intention. Uh, you will block certain types of communication which you yourself would feel is legitimate, but it is uh, sort of inevitably blocked as a side effect of blocking something that you, you actually don't like. Um, the principles that we came to in the ICANN report, uh, the SSAC report number 56, uh, included two very important ones. First, if you're going to implement blocking, uh, and especially as a policy matter, if as a government you're going to mandate blocking uh, in, your, in your local ISPs or perhaps do it in your national firewall, uh, you, you must do two things. And, and I say must not because anyone has the power to compel a sovereign nation to behave uh, in a certain way, but sort of the spirit of the Internet and the continuity and sustainability of the Internet will uh, very, you will be penalized if you do not do these two things. First, you must investigate what the effects will be. Uh, make sure you understand what the side effects uh, and uh, additional effects and the collateral effects of whatever type of blocking you're doing. And second, you should make your policy public. Uh, even if you are not a democracy in the sense of, um, you know, having all of your laws uh, subject to the uh, scrutiny of your, your citizens, you still must tell the world what blocking you have done, even if it's a matter of government mandate uh, uni- unilaterally imposed. And the reason for this is as people uh, detect this blocking uh, or the collateral effects of it, uh, they're going to try and work around it. And you should make sure they know which parts of the blockage they are experiencing is not, uh, it's not because some cable got cut by a backhoe operator. It's not because there's a failure. It's because it's your deliberate intent that certain things not work. Um, otherwise, the operations community uh, has a, or the, the application community uh, has a high likelihood of accidentally working around your policy. Um, so, excuse me. Oh, never mind. All right. Um, So those two things having been said, um, I'd like to ask the panelists some questions. But before I do, I wonder, are there some topics the audience would like to address? You have comments on what's been said so far. You have concerns you'd like to... Yes, we have in the back here. Um, I don't know where the microphone is. Here we go. Yeah, I just like to uh, uh, question about that is uh, which DNS we're talking about because the DNS is everywhere. You know, uh, uh, if you are in in the higher level of the DNS, <laughs> that means everybody is not is not connected. So I think it's a very important we make a definition which DNS we're talking about. Which DNS are we talking about? Um, so as Sharang said, uh, the slogan on all of the ICANN websites and business cards says, uh, one world, one internet. And so indeed, from the point of view of policymakers, uh, there is a global DNS. If a new GTLD gets created because of ICANN policy or a new country code gets created because of uh, UN 3166 uh, revisions, uh, it will be visible everywhere. And there is kind of, uh, I don't know, the default DNS 
It's obviously extended. Inside of most enterprises, you will find that some names work in that enterprise DNS uh, that do not work globally. Uh, so local naming extensions are that, that happen all the time. Um, and it's also certainly possible that the naming system that your laptop or your smartphone uses uh, might include things that are not DNS. Uh, all of this, I think, is uh, below the level of a policy discussion. I think uh, the usefulness of today's discussion will be uh, when we talk about kind of the default DNS cloud that uh, is over everything and is, is our default namespace for the Internet. Uh, we've been joined by Ram Mohan, who is uh, also a panelist. He, uh, wait a moment. To be honest, we, don't, we will not speak about GSMA DNS, which is behind the mobile networks. You're right. We will not be speaking about GSMA uh, DNS today. Thank you. Um, so Ram Mohan uh, from Affilius has joined us. Thank you, Ram. Um, we're currently going around the room uh, asking each panelist to uh, take three minutes or so to outline the issues as we see them. I have already summarized the main conclusions of SSAC Report uh, 56. So thank you, Ram. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I don't want to repeat what's already been said, but um, I, I'd say the, 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 primary, the primary thing to, for everybody here to think about is when policymakers think of the DNS and they look at it, they, it seems to be a very simple way to solve what appears to be a very tough problem. Um, you, you want to have a quick response to uh, what you believe is a security threat, what you believe is a, um, a, a website that is having content that is objectionable, or um, you have... Um, uh, a, a set of domain names that are being used for abusive purposes, and often the the model that that seems to uh, not often but recently the model that seems to be thought about is just go and touch the DNS and block it at that level. And the important um, idea to keep in mind is that the damage that gets done is significant every time. Uh, as a policymaker or as a regulator uh, or as a technologist, you go and, and take that approach because the engineering community, the technical community will end up looking at that and saying, okay, let's find a way around it. And you go from an, uh, a DNS system where you can actually attribute um, uh, who, is, who are the players uh, we could quickly devolve from that system where there is attribution to a system that is completely anonymous and um, becomes much more of the Wild West. So strong caution in, in going down a path of uh, just blocking at the DNS level or taking uh, significant measures at the DNS level, primarily because the countermeasures at the DNS level uh, are asymmetric and can very easily overwhelm any of the measures that you're trying to do on the takedown uh, component. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Ron. So I was hoping that David would be here by now, um, but we will give him his couple of minutes when he does arrive. Um, so again, I will ask the audience, uh, are there issues you'd like to make sure get addressed by this panel or that you'd like to add to the comments that we've already made? Oh, we have some from the panel. Dimitri, please. <laughs> uh, I want to add, but I don't think that we should discuss only DNS and about concentrate it on this one because a policymaker is more worried about the content itself. DNS, we discussed DNS only just one of the tools to execute laws. I don't know what's worse, uh, to use DNS blocking or IP blocking. The most cheapest way. Uh, this is Ram, quickly intervening. Uh, th that's, I think that's a really valid point. Uh, it's, it's actually very hard for me to say which one is worse. Um, <laughs> I, y y 
to some extent, uh, blocking at, at, on, on an individual IP level has become um, it, it, uh, uh, almost a standard way of doing things. There are ACL lists and people, ISPs are very used to working in that model and it's become commonplace and accepted. Um, but again, if you aggregate it up, and and you start to bo- you know block slashes and entire you know entire ASs, then you have the same type of uh, issue that you would have when it comes to domain names or top level domains. And I think that there is a parallel to be drawn there and a caution um, uh, to be placed there. Uh, there are certainly laws uh, on the books in many countries that allow for. Uh, the ability to to take down an individual domain name or even a related block of domain names or an individual IP address or a related block of IP addresses um, that's that's one thing but to but to say okay let's just block the entire an entire subnet or entire range I think there's the same danger exists and it's a slippery slope you go down that path and I I really am worried that that path will eventually lead to, uh, you know, the if effectively uh, the technical, a bunch of technical folks creating an alternate world that we would not all like. So I think the uh, phrase we're avoiding here is balkanization. Uh, we like it that there is mostly one internet for the world and that the same name mostly works everywhere and that we can talk to each other. That's really helping every economy developed and uh, developing um, and you know to the extent that any of the uh, blocking technologies whether IP address blocking domain name blocking or some sort of deep packet inspection or, or content level blocking uh, will cause us to effectively have multiple different internets where not everything is reachable by everybody uh, we are maybe uh, killing the goose that's laying the golden eggs um, in any case, Robert was next. Um, just uh, maybe adding to, to I guess, the, the, the challenges, I, I would just say, is the evolution of information controls. I mean, it's not just IP blocking. It's not just DNS. It's very sophisticated sy- systems that are looking at uh, keywords um, that are doing deep packet inspection on the content and blocking that real time. There's a variety of different things, and I would just saying that the evolution um, of information controls over the last 10 years is very worrisome because it's affecting the underlying, I would say, kind of core principles that we have in terms of an interoperable, non-segmented uh, internet and um, the ability to have an open space that's searchable uh, will, you, you know, is only available if that's the case. And so I think that is a, um, a, a great concern of ours and ones that we've been researching and I would add another thing that I would add as well is that, um, you know, just in relation to one of the other comments that was made before, is that there are other things to consider when we're doing all this. So in the context of we have the technical standards that kind of guide us and, and how they're impacted, it would be great to have a conversation. But there are, there's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 19 and Article 29, two, Part 2, that actually says that if you're going to have limits. They need to be narrowly prescribed as defined by law. And a lot of the blocking is not defined by law, is untransparent, and is a problem. And so I think it's just that's the problem that if the technical community wants to build an open internet and is coming across an opaque um, internet blockage system, we have a problem. And I think that I'd be keen to hear um, from the experience of everyone what some of the technical challenges are and what's going to be broken. Um, and maybe what are some red lines in terms of that shouldn't be crossed um, because there are a lot of policymakers here. And if it, there is going to be some blocking in terms of what are some good recommendations. And I'm not one in favor of blocking. I'm one that prefers very narrowly prescribed for a defined time. But recognizing that there are jurisdictions around the world that have different definitions of what needs to be blocked or not. But, you know, those are the, the things that we need to balance, and I'm looking forward to that conversation. Thank you, Robert. Um, I want to note that uh, in terms of responsibilities, uh, sovereign governance, governments, nations around the world will not vacate what they see as their duty to enforce their laws, to protect their economies, to protect their citizens. Um, and to the extent that the Internet 
uh, runs counter to those laws, uh, action will be taken. And uh, so as much as we can advise, uh, don't do anything that will perturb this global, uh, this wonderful global thing that we have, uh, we should try where possible to offer alternatives. Uh, if you're trying to protect this, here's how you do it uh, in a way that will, will have the least harm on the commons. Um, so uh, I know that John yeah. wants to speak. <clears throat> Part, part of what I was going to say was, uh, you, you've just said it, um, governments do have legitimate rights and roles to play in defense of their culture, tradition, laws. It's completely ridiculous to, to think that there will ever only be one view about how, how the internet should work and, uh, and that that view resides in and is administered by the state of California. Um, it's simply not going to work. Um, and many of the laws, by the way, are carefully prescribed and narrow, narrowly described. So simply having them narrowly described and properly, you know, and made, made law doesn't in and of itself change anything because that's an easy thing for governments to do. Uh, just a, a slightly wider point, and I don't want to send us off on a, on a complete uh, red herring, uh, but a lot of people will be more sympathetic to ICANN's uh, general perspective or profile on this issue if, for example, there was evidence that ICANN was itself dealing with some fairly fundamental issues that law enforcement and governments have consistently spoken about over the years and which ICANN has consistently neglected to deal with over the years. And I mention in particular the Who Is directory. Uh, the level of inaccuracies and the number of problems and difficulties that that causes law enforcement agencies around the world is substantial. It is not insignificant. It is entirely within the gift of ICANN to resolve that problem. It has failed to do so, even though in the affirmation of commitments, which was solemnly signed and solemnly published, it reiterated its, underlying, its commitment to an open and transparent DNS, an open and transparent, sorry, an open and transparent who is database, which is one of the fundamental building blocks of the internet, it has failed to do it. So if I can and the internet community cannot or will not address something that is clearly within its gift and power to resolve, it's hardly surprising that people are going to go off looking for alternative solutions if, you, if the internet community isn't willing to do what it already promised it would do. Karen. Uh, to echo a point that, that was made earlier and to address your concerns, the, the power of states is greatly diminished online. In fact, the more you ramp up the, the arms race uh, between end users and the government, the more people are going to learn to circumvent these measures. Uh, Sweden learned this with the IPRED law, which taught a large number of young people how to resist online surveillance in the name of accessing content. Um, and so the concern that, that I have and that Tor has from working with law enforcement is that blocking is used to hide the fact that things are occurring online while governments are neglecting their responsibilities in areas where they are most able to address issues like child protection, human trafficking, um, theft, intellectual property, which you know, especially when it's theft of designs for physical objects is something that is better addressed in the physical world. So transparency in the matter of blocking allows citizens to object when their governments are just putting a band-aid over issues um, instead of actually addressing them. If your government is blocking DNS but also cutting the funding of child protection agencies, social services, uh, or not investigating corrupt officials, which at every stage of human trafficking are vital for criminals, then DNS blocking is counterproductive. And I think that the internet community can do more to address this, but it has to be, to use UN lingo, a multi-stakeholder process with law enforcement who operate in the physical world because there are no technical measures that can circumvent good traditional law enforcement. Uh, yeah, I just want to give a very quick comment. I, I, I think it's uh, for the DNS blocking or internet content blocking uh, is needed 
a lot of global cooperation. And, and also I think ICANN will play a very, very important role, but, but ICANN is not a body, it's only a collaboration body, uh, it's not a body with very powerful or, or some, some, some power to ask somebody to, to, to do something mandatory. I think it's a, but it's a, ver, it's a very good pl platform for, for the community to, to do something. Uh, for example, now ISAC published a report, it will be a very good recommendation. But also in the future, maybe also some community, including ISAC, can, can publish some kind of recommendation for, for the community to do something for, or, or give some suggestion to do something, because I'm, I'm also the uh, former ISAC member. But uh, now I think it's uh, not enough for, for for ICANN itself and also for some some expert to do, and it's I mean I'm sorry I mean it's not enough. They need much more collaboration, and then also that why we we discussing IGF here. I think it's uh, because there is so many policymakers and also so many uh, I mean ISPs, industry and also some expert, and I think all of us we need to work together, and and also ICANN is uh, is. Uh, it's okay to work together with uh, the industry and the policymakers and the ex in individual experts to develop some kind of suggestion or, or it doesn't mean the policy. Uh, I, I mean, it's I can kind of control everything. Yeah. So noting that uh, ICANN is one of the long list of uh, ISTAR organizations who is not the network police, uh, it is still gets called out in as it's just been here. Uh, that ICANN does have a responsibility to maintain accurate records of uh, who is holding global identifiers. Uh, so who is is an example of this. Um, so I, I want to note several of us uh, on this panel are also members of the Security and Stability Committee. Uh, one of them, Ram Mohan, uh, is our uh, chosen representative to the ICANN board. And uh, so if there was somebody in the room we could blame for the lack of uh, cleanliness in the who is system, it would not be Xiaodong, who is the <laughs> staffer, uh, but it would be Ram. So perhaps, Ram, you can tell us why who is can't be fixed. Well, with that introduction, <laughs> um, two things. Um, the first is that I can, at least in, inside of the I can board, there is absolutely a clear-cut commitment to working on uh, resolving the, the issues that, that come out as a result of inaccurate records in the who is. Uh, in my opinion, um, the, the current measures that are there are, um, are perhaps too granular. You, you know, if you, if you have an individual record, you can go in and you can s submit a complaint and ICANN will do something about it. Uh, we'll, we'll write to the registrar and we'll ask for the record to be looked at. There, there are some policies on uh, by registrars to do annual um, checks and reviews. But clearly we know after doing all of that, we still have a, a, a database with, uh, with records that don't have the sufficient level of, of accuracy or, or even validity, right? Now, Jarong spoke to the ESSAC uh, study. Now, I, the, the Who Is Review Task Force inside of ICANN came out with a comprehensive report, um, and that report has specific recommendations, 14 or 15 recommendations, uh, and, and the board and ICANN itself has a responsibility to, respond, to not only respond but act on those recommendations. It is committed to acting on them. However, Currently, what's going on is the ICANN board is taking cognizance of what the Security and Stability Advisory Committee, the SSACs, uh, comment on the Who is review report was. And, and the SSAC uh, uh, comment document, the, the title for it was, uh, you know, uh, the SSAC uh, response to the Who is review team, uh, Blind Men and an Elephant. And that really brought up the tale of... Uh, what really has been happening with who is because who is itself has been an overloaded term it represents a protocol it represents the directory of names and and the database that holds the names uh, and it also uh, is a placeholder for all of the policy making that that happens around uh, information that is there and what the SSAC has, uh, has exhorted the ICANN board to do um, uh, is to create a mechanism or is to create a committee or something that actually goes back to first principles and asks 
what is the purpose of this data? Who are the right people to get access to the data? What kind of access is appropriate? So it's, it's asking for ICANN to look at first principles and really to say what is the purpose of who is, of the, of the data in the who is, and to also clearly separate, change the language, change the nomenclature, and to say who is does not automatically mean, as it does today, the, both the information and the protocol and the policy but, we're, but to separate them and to say that there is domain name registration data. That is held in a repository. Okay, That is one part. The second part is access to the data about domain names. And the third is policies to determine w under what conditions is that information accessible. Um, and do, does everybody get e access to all of the information? How do you work across jurisdictions across the world which have different rules uh, in, in different jurisdictions, right? So to unravel that, uh, the SSAC's advice is, is having very strong reverber reverberation inside of the ICANN board. Um, but it's, uh, the ICANN board is actually um, not only in the process of um, building out a plan, it's stepping back from simply putting out a resolution or a note that says, uh, yes, we, li we, we saw the WHOIS report. We're just going to go act on it. It's going back and saying, well, uh, let's actually look at you know, what the root cause, what the root purpose is, and go address that. Okay. Uh, if we somehow ended up with extra time, in our slot, I would want to spend it on who is, but the primary <laughs> purpose for which we are gathered is DNS, so I'll ask that we try as much as possible to focus on that. We have a question from this man. Excuse me, can we get a microphone? Yeah. Hello? Right here. Thank you, Paul. Steve Delbiaco with Net Choice, and uh, I'll echo your point that it would be probably a mistake to focus too much on accurate who is as a potential solution to this problem. I am as frustrated as you are, as you know, at ICANN at trying to enforce accuracy on who is. But recognize that we have a diversity of national regimes, many of whom are where registries and registrars are based, where they completely respect the ability of an individual to stay private, even if they're in the corporate realm. And that means that even if it were accurate, it is most often that who is will reflect privacy and proxy registrations for some of the entities that you're most anxious to learn their identity. So even fixing the accuracy still allows individuals to hide by use of proxies and privacy services. So I don't think we want to chase that avenue of who is too much. And I think that was Paul's point, is that we ought to return to a focus on DNS blocking for this purposes. Yeah, I just uh, make very short about uh, who is, and then we turn to the DNS. Uh, a lot of people talking about the, uh, who is, don't forget it. Who is is everywhere too. You know, not only the DNS, not only the GTLD, CCTLD have a who is. Uh, the you know IR IP address have a who is. So don't make the you know the question too simple. It's not that simple at all. And uh, let's back to the uh, DNS. Uh, this is uh, the, the topic for today. Uh, just as I mentioned, you know, the DNS is everywhere. Is uh, you need to figure out which level you are talking about the DNS, and so in, in that case, it's very important. Is uh, you you think about uh, how the I can can do. I'm the I can bore. Uh, to be honest, uh, you you look at uh, the DNS. For example, the DNS of the CCTLD. I can cannot do anything about the CCTLD DNS. We cannot do anything about the DNS in the network operator. You know, we cannot do anything about, you know, the, the, the sovereignty of the government. So be careful about that, which level of the DNS we're talking about. And then the next thing is that I will recommend, just like the chair saying, it's very important is in the process. I will really suggest that any society or any countries, when you want to block anything, you must uh, have uh, some mechanism to let the people really know what is the process you block, what kind of content you want to block, and then in who decided 
who is in the power to decide it? It's only a few people, or or, or really is a, in in a certain reasonable way to process the 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 content you want to block. And then, of course, uh, the, the next part is just like to say, what kind of content you block it, and that the people know. You know, instead of that, we are in a bread box and we went to somewhere, and, and you cannot get access, and, and they will be quite disappointed. Thank you. I think you're emphasizing a point which I mentioned came out of uh, SSEC Report 56, which is that even in uh, countries where it is uncommon for the people being governed to have a lot of say over who is their government or uh, which part of the government makes which decision, it is very important that you, uh, you break that pattern for the transparency of the filtering policy. Um, so you, even if you don't want to expose who made the decision or allow the people to choose who makes that decision, uh, you really will be hurting yourself more than you help yourself if you institute some kind of DNS blocking or IP blocking or any kind of Internet uh, uh, blocking without telling everybody in and inside and outside your country uh, what you did. Uh, Dimitri's next, then Robert. Uh, Paul, thank you. I want to raise a question to auditorium. Because before, uh, people mentioned how to uh, block harmful content. But uh, the also related points, it's how law enforcement works across jurisdictions. But I have a, uh, a simple question. Do we really have any worldwide common definition of harmful content on any point? Is it achievable or not? I think the simple answer there is we won't reach consensus on it in this room. Robert. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of comments and something that you mentioned at the beginning, Paul. Um, I think that, um, you know, I, you know, we're talking about who is, but I think the, the, you know, this is a very passionate issue for me, which is DNS blocking and just blocking generally. With the shift of the Internet uh, and the Internet users to developing countries that are um, not as respectful to the rule of law, we're going to have hundreds of millions, if not a billion people or more, that are blocked and do not have the same Internet experience. That is a problem, and that is a human rights violation, and it is a technical challenge. And, you know, I'm, I'm keen to hear um, what technologies are being um, broken, um, how this is going to affect, you know, DNSSEC. All the stuff about who is will be totally relevant if we have country-level networks that can't do anything. And something that was mentioned before is that, um, you know, that all countries have an open and transparent process. No, 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 no they do not. Um, we have published extensively on how countries have not only opaque um, processes with no rule of law, but a lot of times it isn't necessarily governments, but ISPs and others that are doing the blocking on the behest of other actors. Um, this is a situation that's getting much worse. And there's a lot of research that's being done. So I think it's, it's really important that different stakeholders come together and figure out ways to collaborate. So I just want to pick up on, I think, your comments as well, too, is that for many people, um, blocking should be the exception, not the rule. And recognizing that in certain countries have that, how to have the discussion as to how blocking takes place may be a national security issue, which they can't discuss. And so that is another big challenge. So we need to put what are these challenges? So I would say that's one. In other countries that are willing to talk about it, uh, at what level should they block? Should they block at the core? Should they block at the registry level, at the ISP? I'd be interested to hear people on where might be the most appropriate level. And the other thing, or maybe should the users just block at their own level? And so this was something that I think was attempted in China, having software on people's computers. In a lot of parts of the world, ISPs give um, users software so parents can do it for their children. In my view, that's the end user, the periphery of the network is the best place. Um, so it's a very complex thing, and I would like to go down that path of the consequences and not talk about the peripheral issue of who is, which is equally important, but as the ICANN CEO mentioned in his speech in Toronto, it is as troubling and as complex to figure out as the Middle East peace crisis. <laughs> Middle East issues, whatever. Thank you, Robert. So we've been joined by David Hughes from RIAA. 
Um, I'm going to ask him to describe not so much a human rights problem as an eco economic problem, uh, which is uh, that a lot of online piracy and uh, you know, brand abuse or you know, counterfeiting uh, is very much enabled by the uh, global identifier system, uh, the allocation of domain names. And um, certainly there was a highly public debate in the United States lasting about two years over something called COICA or Protect IP or SOPA, depending on which stage you were, uh, you, you joined the, the discussion. Um, and RIAA took a strong position in favor of mandatory DNS blocking during that debate. Uh, there, uh, I'm glad that David is with us because he can explain, uh, I think, very well why there is a problem, even if SOPA was not necessarily the best possible solution to it. So, David. Thank you, Paul. So, first, let me uh, apologize for joining late. I was um, I was double booked. And I'm doing my best. Um, I'll give you thirty. 20 seconds about myself. I'm a technologist. I started in digital technology at the beginning of my career. I have been in the music industry my pretty much my whole career. Uh, I'm a member of ISOC and a very strong supporter of free and open internet with, as you might understand, some conditions. Um, I'm mostly here to um, find ways to I suppose guide the internet in directions that help to keep honest people honest, help to educate naive people about what uh, behavior, uh, especially um, in the music industry, but generally speaking, about uh, acquiring uh, content through illegitimate channels. And uh, I'm not here to talk about blocking what people can do. Uh, I'm more concerned about changing behavior. You know, the Internet is, is our community, and if you want to have a civil society, we have to understand we need rules, and we need rules enforcement, and we need balance. And I think there are some very balanced people here, and, um, uh, and I actually enjoy my uh, dialogues here very much. Um, we have a problem in the music industry. Um, I guess the basic problem is that most musicians are not rich. They're not the millionaires that you see on TV. Most of my friends are musicians, audio engineers, and other people. The unfortunate reality is about two-thirds of them have lost their livelihood in the past 10 years in the United States. Our, re our revenue has dropped by ab uh, about 55%. And um, it's, it's difficult. We find ourselves in an environment where uh, people will say you need a new business model. And we're trying to compete with um, entities who are giving away the product that we created with our investment and our sweat and trying to compete with a perfect digital copy of your own product in the marketplace is extremely difficult. I am not a big fan, uh, although I am a fan, I will say, of uh, revising some of the copyright laws. I would much prefer to see this done in a collaborative manner in a multi-stakeholder environment like this uh, and look for things like best practices that we can come together and make the internet a better and sort of a better and safer place and that can encourage the development of our culture for the future you know I, I tell my kids uh, they said well our friends are downloading music they've heard that for 10 years now my teenagers saying well my friends stopped buying their books now they're downloading all their books for free and I tried to explain to them. I said, did you like the first book of The Hunger Games? They said, oh, I loved it. I said, well, if nobody buys the first book, there will never be a second or third book in that trilogy. And that's the kind of message that I think we as a society need to understand. Um, I'm here for the rest of the session. If you have specific questions, please feel free. Um, I should mention about, I suppose, about DNS blocking. Um, I think that we went through this period um, of the new laws, and I was particularly involved in the United States with the SOPA proposal. Um, uh, I think that there were a lot of people with good intentions who did not fully understand the technical implications of what, what would happen if they went down the road that they went. I hope that we can avoid that, and I hope that, um, I honestly believe that the policymakers in the entertainment industry have learned their lesson. And I don't think we'll see a repeat of that same thing. 
I don't know what uh, I don't know what will happen next, but I I hope it is a result of our dialogue here. Thank you, David. I think the most important thing that you said uh, might be glossed over by the audience, so I want to uh, repeat it. It's the first thing you said, which is uh, that the industry, as it tries to protect itself, is not trying to change what people can do. Um, right? We all know that any type of censorship uh, will be subject to some type of circumvention. That a determined access or even inside of a country that practices uh, national censor na nation scale censorship, uh, determined actors uh, will find a way to access what they want to access. Um, and so the, and this came up in a lot of my discussions with the music and the movie industries during the, uh, the, the SOPA debates, uh, is changing what people will do if they don't know any better and they're not committed infringers. They're not. They don't ne necessarily want to pirate. They don't necessarily know they're pirating, but they end up pirating a lot of content because a lot of the content is for sale on websites that look uh, very professional, very attractive. Um, it, it, the, the the fact that the industry would be willing to settle for just a an, a drop in the average rate of pir piracy rather than uh, an uh, absolute ending to it uh, was not made apparent early on, um, and it, it makes you guys seem a lot more reasonable when you describe it that way. Um, I, I will add a, a little bit. You know, everybody, um, I think, appreciates when there's a little bit of data. So we have done extensive surveys and studies to understand our marketplace. And the best estimate that I can find in the U.S. marketplace is that of the music that is possessed and listened to, because there's lots of songs that kids download that they never listen to, of the music that, that, that music listeners possess and download, approximately one-third of it was purchased legitimately, and approximately two-thirds was not. I believe, looking at all the studies, that that's... And as Paul said, I think there's some percentage of the people, I don't know if it's 10 or 15 or 25 percent of those people, who will go to extreme measures to find a illegitimate channel for free content. But I think there's also a large population, perhaps one-third of the population, um, that we can educate and we can help them do the right thing, make them feel better about themselves and contribute to their culture of their society and solve the economic problems that, are start that started with music that are now rippling through the motion picture industry, the game industry, and most disturbingly, the newspaper and book publishing uh, industries. And uh, if we got that one-third in the middle to go legit, we would double our marketplace, and I think we would have a viable entertainment industry. Uh, I would not have to watch 8 to 10% of my friends laid off every year as I have for the past decade. Like a microphone? Oh, wait, we got Hi, um, Igor Ostrowski from Silence in Poland, previously in the public service where we uh, created a form of a multi-stakeholder model uh, when actually we went through a quiet uh, digital spring which started with DNS blocking when we talked at this um, multi-stakeholder forum about um, gambling, online gambling and new solutions for combating online gambling and we ended up with ACTA. And so we went through a very difficult process where we talked about different issues of DNS blockage, uh, um, IP, IP uh, URL blockage, the alternative uh, distribution of culture, free culture. And at the end of the day, as a newcomer to this table, we end up with, uh, with a question that I hope uh, some of you may answer. If we decide that blocking is not the way to go, uh, if we say that there are uh, let's say, good, quote-unquote, analog uh, tools we can use to com combat piracy, to combat um, illegal gambling, to combat child pornography, then what exactly are these tools? We've just gone through a, um, a, 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 a big legislative process to, to enact a notice and takedown procedure. And we thought, well, maybe this is the way to go. We'll just do a very wide, good, proper notice and takedown procedure. Now we hear that after the SOPA PIPA ACTA, um, let's say, end, end uh, of the story, there is much more 
emphasis put on uh, notice and takedown procedures by content owners. So there's a huge increase. And we're worried that different small and medium enterprises in Poland will not be able to manage the vast amount of notices that are going to come up. Then, per, then, then, then we're hearing that perhaps we should just use different criminal law tools that were available from, from let's say, the beginnings of criminal code. But then we hear back that, unfortunately, service providers are unwilling to cooperate. There is no flow of data. So, so my question is, relaying back to what you said earlier, what is the alternative to DNS blocking? Or, or URL blocking, for that matter, since it's too expensive for us to expensive for us to introduce. Thank you. So, uh, Karen would like to address that. Um, well, John Carr can probably address this um, at at length, but when it comes to child protection and human trafficking, it requires um, boots on the ground. It requires investigators who are are gifted in using child abuse images um, and and as forensic evidence to, to find, to compare uh, the victim to a, a database of known victims to see if the abuse is new and, and to try to get clues as to lo the location and identity of the victim. That takes uh, a great deal of training. Uh, the people who deal with these images need a lot of psychological support um, because they, they suffer from traumatic stress disorders. Um, uh, having worked both with veterans and having met some of these people, I would say that the people who work in child protection look uh, more traumatized in some cases than people who have come back from war zones. This is um, this is this requires uh, a lot of thought, a lot of compassion. Uh, it's a it's a complicated issue. It's one that some policymakers are just uncomfortable discussing at length. Uh, and then uh, the RIAA, uh, I would say that some of the legitimate purchasing of content is, is made more prevalent by ease of use, reasonable pricing, removal of things like broken digital rights management software, which means that people who pay you for content are getting broken content uh, that doesn't work on the devices of their choosing, that if you can't connect to the DRM server, then you don't get to watch your movie or listen to your music. Um, so which brings a lot of issues of pricing for customers in developing nations, where if, if the price for your movie is the average monthly salary, how are you going to sell in that country? Instead, you go to a market, and for uh, a dollar or less, uh, you can get a pirated copy of the DVD. That's how we, your customers are going to be reached. So I would be curious to get more uh, insight from the content industry on how uh, you would address that. I can start with no. a, a couple. No? Paul doesn't want to go there in this session. We can speak offline. We haven't had DRM for f about five years now in the music industry, so that's just my one comment. Um, so yeah. we're, uh, just everybody wants to talk. I want to um, say I may have erred in what I said to Dimitri earlier. Um, it could be that everyone in this room would achieve consensus that uh, human trafficking is a bad thing and that uh, child abuse, sexual child abuse and images uh, and stories and so forth about that are uh, universally considered bad. So uh, to give us perspective on that, I'm going to ask John to answer the question about Poland uh, to tell us you know, how blocking can work. Uh, you know, what is possible and reasonable? Well, certainly uh, w within, the, within the UK, uh, and uh, admittedly um, I acknowledge your point that it's an expensive way of doing it, uh, URL filtering. Um, if an image is detected within the UK on any server anywhere within, within the UK domain, it will be gone within 60 minutes. Um, and actually, although I say 60 minutes, often it will be 10 minutes. Uh, it, it can be done very, very quickly if the systems are put in place. Um, and I'm coming back to your point and agreeing with my friend from the Tor project, because in an ideal world, we would have lots more boots on the ground, we would have lots more police officers, and we would have lots more resources in social services, reaching out to the children so that the abuse didn't take place in the first instance or that the trafficking wasn't being dealt with, that there were no corrupt border guards, 
that there were no corrupt train inspectors who, who were taking bribes to let these people through. But unfortunately, that isn't the world that we actually live in. And the so two two points really. First of all, when you look at the <coughs> when you look at the scale of some of the offending that's taking place, and you know, we haven't spoken about what's going on around peer-to-peer -peer networks on the illegal side, which nothing to do with uh, you know because it's a slightly different uh, point. But the British police are com completely incapable of dealing with the scale of it. So what do you do? Do you do, you do nothing? I mean. I mean, I'm guessing my point is sometimes a Band-Aid or an elastoplast is the only thing we can do, and it's better than doing nothing. In other words, I don't accept, I don't accept the, and this goes back to your point, uh, it isn't the most efficient way of dealing with it, it isn't the best way of dealing with it, but it might be the only thing that we can affordably do um, that will make some impact. It won't be ideal, it won't be perfect. We don't live in an ideal or perfect world, and, and certainly in Britain and uh, the US and various countries around the world, we're living in times of austerity. Public expenditure is being cut back uh, in every single area of public life. That is not a reason, that is not a license, so it doesn't give anybody a license for saying, well, hey guys, now's the time to get in and do more crime, because the cops can't cope and the industry is paralyzed because of all of these other concerns. No, we have to make the best of it in the world that we actually live in, not the world we would like to live in. So, uh, John, I want you to follow on uh, a little bit more information. Yeah. Um, if the folks in Poland wanted to duplicate the success that you're having in Britain with mm -hmm. your URL level blocking, which yeah. is not DNS blocking and it's not yeah. IP address blocking, uh, is the architecture open? Is it online? Uh, is the, the blueprint of how to duplicate your success? Um, the, the company that originated this, this approach to blocking is BT and they have said uh, consistently since 2004 any ISP, and this works at ISP level so they put it on their, on their network, it's not higher up, um, it's at the network level that it works. They will give you the blueprint which they, they spent a lot of money <laughs> Uh, working it out originally, how to do it with maximum efficiency, with the zero risk of collateral damage, uh, an awful lot of money, and they will give legitimate ISPs who ask for it, they will give them the blueprint, they'll give them the plan uh, for free. So, so you won't have to go through all of the technical stuff, they'll give it to you. All right, thank you, John. So uh, we're down to our last few minutes here. I'd like to uh, go and ask each panelist to give some closing remarks. Uh, one to two minutes, please. Let's start with Ram. Be careful what you wish for. Um, start to do blocking IP address or, or DNS, and um, the outcome could be a far worse world than what we have right now. Um, so some caution and some level of moderation is, is what's really necessary. Um, recognizing that you know, we, we have to have real measures, but um, wholesale blocking um, results in wholesale damage that is most likely not recoverable. Sharon? It's uh, not that only one way to do the DNS blocking to to stop some unexpected information in the internet. Just like if you want to prevent somebody to drive a car, you it's uh, not only one way for you to take it uh, take off his uh, driver license, and and it's not necessary for you to remove all of the cars. So it's uh, better for us to to think about how to do something outside DNS and connect the virtual world and the physical world to stop the unexpected information in the night. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, John cedes his time. Dimitri. Thank you, Paul. I want to, uh, to make a conclusion because my questions will follow a concrete goal. Uh, if we have common understanding that a harmful content exists and you just have a list. If we recognize that blocking independent which one exists, uh, I think that uh, only SEC 56 is not enough. 
as a best practices. Yes, we have a bad experience with some best practice which still don't <laughs> implement it on the network. But I think we should do some joint work to produce more clear BCPs. So. Thank you. David? Um, I'm not going to touch on the law enforcement issues or anything else, but what I would say is that uh, I guess sort of in a, in a post-SOPA, post-SAC 56 world, maybe what we should be talking about is, uh, is uh, having, having a group of people uh, to focus on alternatives to DNS blocking. Maybe that, maybe that was really the session that we should have had, <laughs> but we weren't there yet. Thank you for that. Robert? A lot of a lot of quick kind of comments, I guess, is that there's a growing number of countries and um, ISPs that are blocking around the world, and they're blocking for a variety of reasons. Some of which are legal, and some of which are um, very, very, very opaque. As Ram mentioned, we have to be very, very careful what we ask for. Um, but if there are circumstances or conditions that we agree as a society and that will vary from country to country that we do need to block let's make sure that there are things that we subscribe to as key things that we want to keep in mind and i would say that the universal declarations this is a u.n meeting and we are um that that is something that um, we all must follow you know there's article 19 and as i mentioned earlier 29 as well that talks about the exceptions and I think that when we do have the exceptions or when we do have mechanisms, I think where I will disagree a little bit with my, with, with my colleague is that when there are mechanisms that do that, um, yes, there needs to be best practices. The law around it needs to be very open and transparent so the public knows. But there needs to be oversight and regular reporting as to what the organizations do. To say that there have been um, no collateral damage. There have been several well-publicized cases of certain websites or Wikipedia going down because of content that was then afterwards not deemed to be objectionable. Um, and so, well, that's, I, I'm just saying that um, others may not be as open and transparent and quick to react as you were to correct that situation. And so if you're going to scale it to other countries, let's make sure that they also will be able to correct situations when they overblock. Going to your points and others as well, I think, is that there may be things like child content and others that we agree on, and definitely sharing best practice is important. And going to your point as well, too, is that um, there may be stakeholders that, at first, we may have issues to deal with, but when we see that we, we have common points and then we see clear objectives of what the different stakeholders want to do with education and discussion, we might be able to work together. And that's a lot better than having a lot of time, energy, and effort on legislative proposals that take up time when there are many other issues to really deal with in this world. Um, I repeat myself when I say there are no perfect solutions. Even if they did come into being, they would be fleeting. So when it comes to drafting policies on technology, it's important to at least not impede the work of people who are, in some cases, taking up the slack of governments on the ground. And that includes not only blocking their, their research, which may be unpopular um, because a government or a uh, other entity is interested in covering up the fact that these problems exist, or in the case, even with due process, of making the cost of defending your content so high as to make only large corporations with legal departments able to defend themselves. So, uh, so do not impede the process of people. Look out for collateral damage. And when there are cases of due process, make sure that they are accessible to everyone involved. Thank you all. My own. Uh comments here are that uh, in terms of guidance to policy, uh, if you're within the sound of this panel's voice and you are uh, going to be recommending some government action uh, that has to do with censorship or blocking of content, blocking of, of something on the internet, um, what we've heard here today is a, a strong plus one on the conclusions in the SAC 56 report. Uh, that whatever you do should be uh, transparent, 
uh, even if it's unilaterally imposed, make sure that it's not a secret because it can't. Uh, we have no such secrets. Uh, people will figure out uh, using open research methodology uh, what is happening, uh, and you be you will be stronger if you get out in front of it and uh, announce what you're doing before some uh, magazine article tells the world what you're doing. Um, and uh, with that said, I'm. Uh, interested in pursuing the ways in which human rights can be protected, uh, but also national law can be respected in spite of the Internet. Uh, there is a Wild West atmosphere to the Internet. Uh, there's a sense, not just that our teenagers have, but uh, that the criminals of the world have, uh, that now that we have the Internet, uh, boots on the ground don't matter anymore. Uh, you can break the law over there as long as you're not breaking the law over here. There will be a connection between over there and over here that you don't even have to maintain. And so you can do things that would be against the law over there without ever being subject to any type of recourse. Uh, that is a problem. And it may be that the world that, uh, is, uh, that existed before the Internet and still surrounds the Internet, uh, that, that is us, the, the, the real world, is going to have to do some cross-jurisdictional work in order to figure out how we're going to respect each other's laws on the internet, even if that means uh, discouraging activities over here that are not illegal over here, but they are illegal over there. Um, this is a problem that the internet can help you solve. If, on the other hand, uh, you think you have no choice but to pretty much handle it as a national problem and just go unilaterally deploy solutions, uh, what you'll find is that the Internet is also very capable of working against you. Uh, so let me urge, uh, please contact any panelist or contact uh, Patrick Falstrom, who's the chair of the Security and Stability Committee for uh, ICANN. If you have further questions, uh, concerns that weren't addressed here, uh, um, any inquiry on this topic is welcome. Uh, th those of us who are working on this are going to continue working on it. And uh, we would welcome your participation in that work. So um, we are at lunchtime. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.